So just to walk you through what we're going to be doing today, um, from welcoming you all, I also want to do a land acknowledgement very quickly, if you don't mind. Then we'll introduce, I will introduce the, uh, the speakers one at a time. Uh, then we're going to have an open mic discussion, reflection. Um, and then we're going to talk all together as well about actions for moving forward. And then if we have time, and I say if we have time, because as you can see there's quite a, quite a little bit of, uh, um, uh, of items on the agenda and two hours I'll go very, very quickly. But that's what is gonna happen, okay? Um, so before we begin, I would like to, uh, to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the indigenous people of Castoral Island. And we thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. This is not an easy land acknowledgement today as we all probably are aware of the, the stories that are coming out in the news in terms of the finding of the uh, mass graves uh, of children who died during the residential schools. Uh, that is not uh, an easy, this is not an easy time for, for all of us. So we want to acknowledge that. To the original caretakers of this land on which we stand, I acknowledge the land of the Huron Wendat, the Patton, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully uh, share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes, where I am right now. I invite you to think and reflect of the land and the territories from where you are joining us in this meeting and think and reflect on, on the people, um, the creation that was there before the arrival of uh, Europeans. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Terra Island, we honor the struggles and their lives and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and we acknowledge the land. Our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree, the Métis, the Dene, the Soto, and the, and the Anishinaabe, the, Ako, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all nations that came before us and those yet to come. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respect to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. Once again, I, I acknowledge the land of the Huron Wendat, the Patton, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas are the credit of First Nation. This territory is covered with, by the Dish with One Spoon One Pendel Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the lands and resources around the Great Lakes where I am right now. I'd like to call on, um, at this moment, I'd like to call on, on Connie, if you would please introduce our friends. You need to unmute, yep. Yes, <laughs> okay. I would like to start by saying thank you so much for joining us, you know, uh, this afternoon. Uh, this is the last of the series of our webinars. And uh, for this afternoon, I would like to uh, give, I, I'd say special welcome to our friends from Service Canada who are joining us. Um, they are, uh, Mika, Mika Duneski, she's the service manager uh, at the program deliver, delivery branch at Service Canada, Ontario region. We also have with us today, Hannah, Hannah Kutanko. She's a senior officer with, uh, yeah, program development officer, also Service Canada, Ontario region. And Mark Kim, also within, with the same, you know, uh, branch, uh, the program uh, delivery branch. So welcome uh, folks and thank you for taking the time to join us and listen to our partners this afternoon. 
I was also wondering, Connie, if you could take maybe a couple of minutes just to offer some general comment on an introduction of the program that we have done in, in the past six months. And this webinar, as, as you all know, is, is the, the last uh -huh. webinar in a series of webinars that we've done starting in, in February. And then we will proceed with, with the speakers and I'll introduce the speakers one at a time. I ask you all for your patience and understanding as, as you know, just, just hang on to your questions or if you want to ask questions, you can write them on the chat as well. Uh, if not, just hang on to your questions and then uh, after the speakers, there'll be time for each and every one of you, hopefully to, to be able to speak and to ask questions or make comments. So Connie. Yes, um, thank you again, Alfredo. Um, Actually, for today's, you know, webinar, just before the brief background, I just wanted to say that one, and this is our uh, code unquote report back to the community in terms of, you know, the work that we've done and the achievements, but also the challenges, you know, over the last six months. So in December, uh, 2020, Kairos received, uh, received 2.1 million funding from uh, the federal government to support temporary foreign workers in Canada, particularly those in, you know, uh, in the farms. So to men and women who labor, you know, uh, the fields to ensure that we have uh, continuous access to food and food security. So with the 2.2, one million grant, we were able to uh, partner with about 14 community organizations across Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and the Prince Edward Island. And with this, you know, 14 uh, community partners, it's actually equivalent to about 50 other organizations collaborating with our partners in delivering support and services uh, to migrant farm workers. Um, so with this project, we, uh, the objectives of this project, one is to provide um, accurate information, uh, government sourced information to arriving temporary foreign workers, particularly those working in the farms about COVID-19, <coughs> sorry. Um, providing them support and services uh, again uh, during COVID-19 when you know they are not able to access uh, support and services that are not available to temporary foreign workers. So uh, in that you know objectives uh, we were able to provide emergency housing support food delivery and also uh, welcome bags that contains uh, personal PPEs, um, personal hygiene and sanitation products, and also some snacks and, 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 and food. Um, we're also able to provide uh, referrals and uh, accompany you know, workers to be able to access uh, services and benefits that they are entitled, entitled to while working in Canada. So from December 17th, uh, to, to tomorrow, which is the, the project timeline, December 17th to June 30th, we were able to really reach out to a lot of migrant farm workers, and I would say about 25,000. Uh, sometime, you know, in the beginning of May, we were able to include in our service, uh, airport support services. So uh, in May, uh, we were able to uh, provide staffing at the airport uh, to meet and support uh, migrant farm workers uh, arriving, uh, to accompany them as they line up, you know, for a switch health, the uh, COVID testing upon arrival, uh, pick up the kits, you know, for the eighth day mark of uh, their quarantine and provide them with information that they need while in quarantine, but at the same time, connect them with our community partners to whichever destination they are going. Uh, as, as I've mentioned before, we're kind of spread out across Ontario and also in the three maritime provinces. So this is, you know, the gist of, you know, the project. And as we, as we go into, you know, listening to our 
uh, partners would be able to see more and hear more uh, what they've done, the work that they're, you know, the achievements and also how many workers they've reached out to uh, during the six months. So um, hold on and yeah. Uh, and again, thank you for, uh, for joining us. So I want to once again welcome each and every one of you, especially those who join us after we, we started. Uh, I'm glad to see you all here. Thank you so much for being with us. It's great to see you. This is the last webinar in the series of we, we've been doing. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker. Uh, and each and every one of you, the speakers will have about six to seven minutes to, to speak. Uh, and then after that, we'll open it up for the participants to ask any questions or comments with regards to what you just heard. So I'm going to start with, with uh, Nate Dirks. I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name, Dirk, uh, Nate. I apologize for that. But in any case, um, they, uh, Nate works with the South Ridge Community Church in Niagara, Ontario. He's married to Taryn, and they had three boys. Uh, um, as part of the Southridge Community Church in the Niagara region, uh, they own a Vineland. Uh, at, at the Vineland location, they run the Caribbean Workers Program, with, which connects relationally with, with three, approximately 300 migrant farm, farm workers, mostly coming from Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, St. Vincent, uh, Dominica, and Grenada. So pretty much the Caribbean islands. Um, with any further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to, to Nate. Yeah, thanks so much, Alfredo, and thanks, everybody. It's great to be together here, and uh, it's just, it's always good moments to be able to express solidarity around uh, our friends in the uh, the migrant worker community, and I just appreciate being able to, to see the different people doing different work, and so I'm just glad to be a part of that here today. Um, yeah, I just wanted to take a few minutes just to, to let you know what, what we're uh, what we've been privileged enough to be able to do uh, through our community and um, and also how we've just been able to, to receive support for that, uh, even through Kairos this year, which has just been fantastic. Um, so a little bit of background, as Alfredo just gave uh, some context for where we're located in southern Ontario, and it's a, a large farming community around here. And the model that we have through our, uh, through our Southridge Community Church has been to try to, uh, to foster relationships with migrant farm workers who are in proximity um, to where our, we're located in Vineland. And so there are thousands of workers in the, in the region at large. And what we've realized is that if we can focus on at least the, uh, the 300 or so workers who are in closest proximity to where we are as a community, um, that we're able to, to sort of have the, the greatest amount of um, sort of efficacy in being able to, to connect with them and support their needs. Because uh, this particular part of our church is about 300 people as well. And so the way that the model that we have is basically to be able to try to foster individual and personal relationships with people from within uh, our community, um, you know, who, who live here obviously year round and are citizens here and, and living in the Vineland area and are part of our church. And the way that we do that is we have um, the expectation at our church is, is that if you're, if you're here and you're participating, that, that we're, you're going to be a part of a group that will connect with a specific group of migrant farm workers. Um, so you don't have to know all 300 guys, but we, are, but we connect um, different small groups uh, with different farmhouses. So if it's a group of five guys who are living at a farmhouse, we'll uh, foster a relationship with about five or eight people from our church as well to specifically get to know them um, uh, individually. And it's obviously a tough process. It's not as easy as just saying, hey, my friends. It's saying, hey, starting to try to get to know each other and say, hey, we're your neighbors. You know, would, would it be possible to drop in sometime? And and it's it takes years and years. And so about seven years into it now, we have a lot of really great established friendships. And and it, it looks like um, our migrant farm worker friends dropping by. If if you know if people have if their friends have a pool, they'll drop by and be swimming after work. There'll be barbecues, and it really is like creating extended family for our friends who don't necessarily have uh, who don't have a lot of community supports around here, like you'd hope that you'd be able to have in a place where you're living you know, the majority of the year. So uh, a lot of that just sort of sort of creates um, a really great relationship. And within that, um, you know, we'll do sort of larger events as well throughout the years. We'll do large dinners and barbecues. And obviously we're talking outside of COVID and we'll speak a minute to, to what's happened during COVID. You know, we'll do Niagara Falls nights and 
you know, since we're relatively close to Niagara Falls and there'll be concerts and on Father's Day, we always do a bowling tournament where we rent out an entire bowling alley and everybody just has a bowling tournament together to celebrate the fathers who spend time away from their kids year after year. And within that, uh, responsive to those relationships that are then formed, obviously then we, we see needs that our friends have and the relationship isn't based on need, it's based on these are relationships and friends. But as we get to know each other and we, as there's mutual supports, um, we, like family would do, we try to be responsive to some of the needs that our, our friends are experiencing. And some of them are obviously in the largest systemic challenges. So there we realize that with, you know, healthcare is a challenge when our friends aren't in proximity to need, it's not confidential, it's not available during times uh, that work for them as farm workers. So we have a clinic that's been set up through a provincially funded community health program that's set up in our church now that we run throughout the summer and connections through legal aid, uh, through trying to, to, to grow some living condition supports uh, to work with farmers and not create more stigma, but it's how we can work together to help improve living conditions locally. That's a newer one we're, we're, we're working on. Uh, and the social connection at large. So we've set up a, what we call a Caribbean center that's sort of a drop-in center with pool table, big screen and things like that to, to also help workers also not during COVID, but from different farms to get to know each other and to know that they're a larger community body and a more important body of people than are necessarily uh, acknowledged. And we want them to feel that and not feel isolated and like they're by themselves on their own farm as just a small group. So that's something that we try to do and to foster. And with all of this, um, through this, you know, there's obviously different ways that during COVID that it's been more challenging to foster the relationships out of respect and trying not to pass COVID on to our friends who are in uh, challenging living conditions a lot of the time. And we haven't wanted to be people to have, you know, to disrespect both the, the, the farms and the farm workers in that way. And so we've tried to connect in different ways. And in the midst of that, it's just been really wonderful to have the support through, uh, through this funding through Kairos. And one of the things that, uh, or the thing that we were able to do, a few thousand dollars that we were able to receive through Kairos um, especially during lockdown a few months ago, was uh, that we were able to buy in bulk, um, you know, the, the 50 to 80 pound um, bags of rice and then the flour and different beans and brown sugar and sugar and things like that. And basically for our friends during the lockdown, a lot of them would be, you know, coming in and then being in quarantine and even beyond quarantine, the challenges of for farm workers of leaving the farms, some of which are provincial regulations and some of which would actually be some of the rules that their own farmers would, would be implementing on top of that, would obviously make it difficult for them to leave and be able to receive everything they need. And so even though that they would have been receiving food, some of them, there, it was, sometimes it was insufficient or it wasn't exactly what our, what, what our friends were looking for. And so in this way, through the funding, what we we're able to do is just be able to buy just skids and skids worth of food and then be able to bring these packages of, of, uh, of different types of food to, to through the, these relationships. So all of like the families would come pick up the food and then go to their specific, the farm that they've been connecting with and drop off that food in ways that's, that were COVID safe uh, with the protocols. And uh, we just had a really great, great feedback from that and just a, a lot of appreciation from our friends uh, in terms of how that was able to help. And for us, um, just as I conclude, the... Um, the way that we were able to, um, one of the ways that that helped was just the fact that uh, it provided obviously the practical support, the actual food, and it also helped to continue to be a part of the maintaining of relationships with our friends during times where it's been difficult to show support. And it was just one way to show solidarity and to help to maintain our friendships and to say, hey, you know, even when times are tough, you know, we're here for you. And uh, yeah, and, we, and there's a larger community that's looking out for you as well. And being able to say this didn't just come from us. This came from a larger community at large who are thinking about you. And we know that that um, was well appreciated and they felt that solidarity. So yeah, so that's a, a little bit about ourselves and just appreciate being able to be a part of this larger community. That's great. Thank you so much, Nate. That's amazing. Perfect timing. Really appreciate that. And uh, I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker is uh, Jezebel Amora. Again, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name, Jezebel. Uh, she is the project coordinator at uh, Filipino Canadian Community of New Brunswick. She immigrated uh, to New Brunswick in, in 2016. Uh, she has a BA in computer science and will recently be, we will recently be graduating uh, or shortly be graduating from um, advanced system management and cybersecurity. That sounds pretty impressive. Uh, <laughs> and she's been uh, in this role uh, as coordinator, um, you know, 
enjoying this work as coordinator because it gives an opportunity to give back to the community. Uh, so, Jezebel, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to let you do the talking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Alfredo. Um, yes, so I am actually a new project coordinator to, um, to the organization, uh, which is FCND or Filipino Canadian Community of New Brunswick. I started working there in December and um, it's not new to me that the organization has been like helping uh, temporary foreign workers, but mainly are focusing on Filipinos. Um, with this project, it's given us a privilege to help not just Filipinos, but other temporary foreign workers as well of uh, different nationalities. And um, we are so grateful and we were so happy that we were able to connect to other um, settlement services as well, uh, connect them to settlement services and also assist them with their needs. Um, with this program, we were able to uh, reach out to 600 uh, migrant workers. And um, the good thing about this program as well is that we were able to help not just the, the existing migrant workers here, but we were also able to help um, new uh, comers. So we were able to provide um, food, um, like especially to those who really need or who are in in need of culturally appropriate food. So um, when we were able to deliver the food to them, all of them were really happy and excited that they were able to um, eat the kind of food that they were used to. And um, the biggest challenge I'd say that we have in this project is we're only around well, there's only two coordinators here in, um, in this organization, and we have to travel the entire province of New Brunswick. Just recently, last weekend, uh, we traveled around 1,000 kilometers to reach out to uh, 48 um, migrant workers, and that's different places, not just in one town or one city, but it's like traveling from south, east, west, you name it, but it's a very fulfilling um, a project because it's not just we're working with temporary born workers, but we were able to enhance our network, our connections with uh, settlement services with other organizations and as well as Kairos. So it's been a privilege and I am so grateful that we are part of this project. Looks like several of us are having internet troubles. I'm sure Alfredo will be back in a moment. Okay. Um, Connie, do you want to introduce our next speaker? I think Sandy was to be next. I could introduce Sandy. <laughs> I'll take an introduction from anyone, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy Falcon is the program coordinator at uh, Unknown Neighbors, which uh, Sandy's office is in Barrie. She can tell you a bit more about the range of Unknown Neighbors. We were very happy. Unknown Neighbors is one of the newest organizations in our project, and so she'll, I'm sure she'll tell you a bit more about that. And uh, Sandy is uh, doing some master's or doctorate level research, as well as doing this work. So sorry, I didn't have all those details in front of me. Sandy, I'll turn it over to you. No worries. Thank you so much. It is my master's in social justice. Um, and thank you very much for the introduction. I actually wanted to share my screen. Is that okay? Yes, that should be fine. Okay. 
and you can all see my screen. Okay. Yes. Looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I am Sandy Falcon and I am the project coordinator of Unknown Neighbors. Um, so Unknown Neighbors was the title of a Simple County Kairos interactive gathering back in October uh, 2017, which was held at St. Mary's Catholic Church in Barrie. The gathering consisted of presentations and workshops focused on migrant workers in Simcoe County and was attended by 40 people. The idea was to shed light on the presence of migrant workers living and working in Simcoe County and to engage residents in exercises to help them understand how migrant workers are treated and respected in their work environments. Um, so I'll share a few of our highlights, although we do have so many of them, but um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, respect everybody's time. But Unknown Neighbors has so far reached 244 workers in 16 weeks. Um, and that count is increasing week by week. Um, coordination and collaboration with uh, South Georgian Bay Health Center to get first dose vaccines to 11 workers. Um, Unknown Neighbors was able to achieve incredible progress during a provincial lockdown and COVID restrictions. Um, unlike our fellow organizations, we did not have years of collaboration and relationships with the community prior to the project. Um, Unknown Neighbors became a group in March and has managed to make some significant impact on the Simcoe and Gray Bruce counties, which is where we're focused. Um, we've created and fostered relationships, not only in our community, but also in the organizations that we work with. And Unknown Neighbors has proven that we are needed and we intend to fill the need for our farm friends and migrant worker friends. Uh, the positive effects so far uh, in our community, um, Unknown Neighbors has begun to establish a presence in Simcoe County. Um, every day we reach more and more farmers and their workers. We have started to earn the trust of the workers whom we have assisted and through word of mouth amongst employers, we have also been able to connect with more employees. Uh, we have begun to earn the trust needed to collaborate with organizations that are willing and able to help extend our reach. Community impact beyond the lifespan of this project. So Unknown Neighbors um, has established the service for a need that exists in Simcoe County. In the future, we will continue to be present in the community and for our friends that use the connection to our organization. Unknown Neighbors is now incorporated and awaiting charitable status approval. So Unknown Neighbors is here to stay. And that is all thanks to Kairos and, and this project uh, without them and the support and the connection and collaboration with all of the uh, partners, we, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we've uh, managed to accomplish up until now in such a short amount of time. So uh, maintaining momentum and continuing to strengthen our collective work. So we are going to continue our outreach in the community through social media and community newspaper. We, did, we were um, in the community newspaper in Simcoe.com. Um, there will be continued collaboration and partnership with community organizations that can refer workers and employers looking for support. So we um, share our Facebook page and um, organizations such as the Barry Families Unite Facebook group and Dress for Success Aurelia and Barry. They have also shared our posts from Facebook, um, which gives us a, a much bigger reach in the community. Um, so we went from reaching 323 or, um, people on Facebook organically uh, once we got um, other organizations involved in one day, our post was shared over a thousand times amongst all of the people who were able to see it. Um, and that was just in one day of sharing one of our posts. So that's been fantastic. And I'm sure that we can continue that momentum. And lastly, just a little bit about who we are. So Sandy Falcon, that's myself. I am the project coordinator. I work with two other part-time uh, 
project assistance. One is Wilma Dello. She speaks Filipino. She is very connected in the uh, Barry community, especially in the Filipino community. And um, Ashley Earl, she represents um, and finds more workers in the Gray Bruce Collingwood area. And our steering committee, um, which is why we've been able to continuously grow and find more people and more connections is um, we work with Elaine and Dr. Doug West from Simcoe County Kairos. And we are also connected to the Berry Hill Farms in Springwater, the Collingwood Public Library, Countryside United Church and Valley Farm Market. So we have very good connections so far and I am very confident that we will continue to grow. Um, uh, but again, as I mentioned before, without the funding that we received, we wouldn't have been able to um, initiate the project the way that we did and make leaps and bounds and we will continue to do so. I am, I'm very confident of that. And that is all that I have. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sandy and uh, Shannon for jumping in. You, I guess you all noticed that I'm having difficulties with the internet, just so you know, there is a huge storm just happening to go by right now, you, it'll probably reach you at one point or another to those of you who are in Ontario, uh, close to Toronto. Uh, if that happens, hopefully uh, the, it won't interfere with the meeting. So you should all be able to go, to go ahead and continue with the meeting. Um, I'm going to proceed then to, um, before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to remind you that um, thanks to the support also from the, um, federal government through Service Canada is that, that, you know, all of you partners have been able to do the work as well. And um, San, uh, Sandy was just recognizing that. And I just wanted to uh, add that recognition to, to the federal government for supporting this project uh, for each and every one of us. Um, our next speaker is um, Stacy Gomez. Stacy, she is based in Nova Scotia. She works with No One Is Illegal, but I also know that she also works with another organization that is called Breaking the Silence in, the, in Nova Scotia and with partners in Guatemala. As Stacy herself will tell you a little bit more about the work she does. And Stacy, if there's anything else that you would like to add uh, with, re with regards to the work you do here in Canada, that would be great. The mic is yours. Okay, thanks a lot, Alfredo. And would it be possible for me to share uh, some slides? I think I can. Okay. Oh, I see the option. Perfect. Great. Um, so yes, uh, hi everyone. It's really lovely to be here with you today uh, to hear everything that everyone has been up to, and yeah, just to share a little bit from our <laughs> from our side of the country <laughs> over here. Um, so yes, um, as Alfredo mentioned, I'm with No One Is Legal Halifax, and uh, specifically with our Migrant Workers Program. And we're engaged in uh, direct support uh, with migrant workers, as well as outreach and education and advocacy. And uh, through this uh, project uh, funding, we have most definitely been able to increase our capacity. Um, so during this, um, project. Uh, we've been uh, connecting with workers from throughout Nova Scotia, from Cape Breton to the south shore of Nova Scotia. And uh, every day we hear from, from uh, new workers who are reaching out to us. Um, so uh, we've been able to reach out to over a thousand migrant workers in, in the past, uh, in the past uh, four or five months. Um, and yeah, it's been a quite intensive uh, time for us. Uh, we're definitely a small team, but uh, yeah, we have been uh, really, you know, um, appreciative uh, to be, yeah, to be able to, to access uh, this funding that would otherwise not be available to our uh, organization. And um, yeah, so uh, just to mention that, um, so I'm gonna share a few pictures just to share a little bit about what we've been up to. Um, so as others mentioned, um, so we've been engaged in uh, food support, uh, emergency uh, food support to migrant workers, as well as um, providing uh, welcome bags uh, to migrant workers 
uh, when they're arriving here in, in Canada, which is, has information on their rights. And as Connie mentioned, uh, PPE as well as uh, culturally relevant snacks. So I wanna share a quote um, that we received from someone um, that I think highlights you know, uh, how, yeah, how, how this has been received. So uh, she writes, um, hope you're keeping safe. I came up in April and I was in quarantine for 14 days. It was one of my worst times ever being locked down for so long. Most of all, the food was awful because it wasn't the type of food that fits our culture. We could not wait to get out. One day we, we received a care package from your organization and was surprised that Jamaica St. Mary banana chips was in it. Oh Lord, even though it was small, I had it for my dinner. It made my evening. Thank you so much and keep doing the good work that you are doing. Um, so yes, it's been uh, really lovely hearing directly from uh, workers um, around um, the work that we've been up to. Um, so I'll share a few quotes uh, as, we, as we share in this, uh, as we share with each other. Um, and yes, definitely the issue of food access in quarantine has been uh, one, of the, one of the issues that we've seen and heard directly from migrant workers and advocated uh, here in the province to improve. Um, so as a result of some of that advocacy, there have been some improvements made, um, but this is an ongoing issue that we continue to work around. And I also want to show you some of these seedlings. So as part of our support, uh, we wanted to uh, provide some culturally relevant uh, seedlings uh, to uh, migrant workers. Uh, and so uh, these, the community members helped us to, to grow these because we, uh, including myself, do not have any gardening experience. So that would be very difficult for, for us to do on our own. And so the community support us, supported us in that, which was amazing. I think there was around like 50 volunteers or more who stepped up um, to, to support us in these efforts. And so this is uh, the epazote. Uh, that we uh, provided actually to migrant workers last week. And it was lovely because uh, even one group of workers who, who we hadn't met before, um, when we went, we are, do regular outreach and we took these on a regular outreach and they said, yeah, we came early. <laughs> we came early to meet you and to get some plants. So that was really nice. Um, and then in addition, we've also been engaged in um, public education. Um, so we had uh, this is one example of, of one of the events that we had. It's called Will You Be My Neighbor? And it was a virtual conversation on how we can create a more welcoming and inclusive community for migrant workers in Nova Scotia. Um, so we're based here in Halifax, but we are, our work has been taking place throughout the province, including in the uh, South Shore, uh, where uh, there is, um, yes, there are workers that are engaged in the Christmas tree sector. Uh, and so this is a relationship that we have from, uh, yeah, from as of uh, last year. And uh, yeah, we had this lovely event where a uh, migrant worker, his name is Felix, uh, he spoke about his experiences living in, in, in the Lunenburg County in Nova Scotia, and also uh, Samuel Jess, who is a pastor, uh, who has been engaged in, uh, in, you know, fostering friendship with, uh, with migrant workers in that area. And uh, they shared and had a lovely uh, conversation about what can community members do to challenge the isolation that's faced by migrant workers. Uh, and as we know, like this has a significant impact on migrant worker mental health uh, and general, uh, you know, uh, their, uh, their experiences here in the province. Uh, we had also heard that there has been an uptick in racism here uh, in Nova Scotia, I'm sure it's, this is probably also the case elsewhere in terms of uh, xenophobia around uh, COVID-19 and migrant workers being blamed for the pandemic. And so these kind of events have been really important to open up conversations with community members around what are the experiences of migrant workers and, and how can we each, um, yeah, how can we each step up uh, to, to, yeah, to, to help uh, the situation. So I wanted to share uh, that photo and that's the poster from our event. And we just yeah, did lots of postering for that. Um, and besides that, um, something else that, that we did was also uh, during, uh, the, uh, during the quarantine period, um, uh, we had uh, some intensive uh, English uh, exchanges uh, with migrant workers. Um, and we found that that really helped to foster community 
uh, with uh, migrant workers. Um, so that was really uh, lovely and opened up a space for workers to talk about issues uh, like, uh, like racism um, that, as I mentioned, um, has, we've seen <clears throat> increase during COVID-19. Um, so yes, those are a few things I wanted to share. Uh, we also have a migrant support line uh, where we regularly respond to questions around health, around uh, there's uh, so sometimes questions around immigration, uh, et cetera. And so, yeah, that has been uh, quite active as well. And um, yeah, has been a really important part of our outreach to, uh, to migrant workers. Uh, so I'll just share, I guess, a few uh, more quotes. Um, so this is from Mario. He says, I'm very thankful for the, for the care with which you, you've treated us. <clears throat> it's been a big help for us. It makes us feel like we are not so far away from our families. <clears throat> and uh, another quote, I just want to say thank you very much, uh, Stacy and the team. Honestly, from the day I got here, got this number, I felt much different, like somebody really cares. Some, someone at the end is looking out for we guys in so many ways, like checking in if you're okay, welcome bags, keeping us up to date on information, things like that. It makes you feel like uh, welcome, feel like you really want to come back. If, on, if only everyone was like this, it would be so much better. Uh, and uh, just a final quote. Um, Good day, my name is Alfredo. I'm a migrant worker from Mexico. I wanted to thank you for the help you've given us. I wanna thank you for the workshops you've done online. Uh, they've been a big help. Thanks to these, we can be informed on a number of things. With these, our doubts are clarified. Above all, the workshop on the COVID-19 vaccine. A lot of doubts we had were clarified. We wanna thank you also for the food support. Truly, this was a big help. Um, so yes, that brings me to something else. Um, so we've definitely been doing a lot of work around vaccine access for migrant workers, including uh, supporting migrant workers in, uh, in making their bookings, accompaniment and interpretation during uh, the uh, vaccinations, as well as advocacy uh, around how the provincial government can improve vaccine access for migrant workers. Um, there's still many ongoing uh, challenges and this is an ongoing area of work uh, that we're focused around. Uh, the workshops that were mentioned, we had uh, two workshops around uh, the vaccine, one in Spanish and one in um, English. Uh, the most recent one was last week where we had uh, Dr. Haas. He's an infectious disease specialist uh, and also from Jamaica. And that one was geared towards uh, Caribbean migrant workers. And it, it's just uh, definitely a gap that we're seeing here is is vaccine education that is accessible in the language of migrant workers and also culturally relevant. Um, so for example, uh, there is a two page uh, document that the provincial government, uh, I don't know if they provided it to migrant workers, um, but we've been doing uh, education and we know that kind of something written like that is not sufficient um, because uh, there, there are uh, oftentimes uh, like liter barriers with literacy, for example. Um, so uh, yeah, so we've been trying to find ways to uh, to uh, yeah make this uh, get this information to workers so that they can make an informed uh, decision around the uh, vaccine. Um, and also we have uh, we've been doing workshops. We did one last week, and we have one tonight actually around migrant worker rights and COVID nineteen. Uh, so yeah, we've received uh, lots of interest around this. So that will be uh, that's something that I'm looking forward to, and we have a. Uh, a lawyer whose name is Donardo Jones is going to be giving that one in Patois in English. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to make our our work as accessible as possible uh, to uh, migrant workers. And yeah, just uh, I look forward to what we can continue to do because we're definitely going to continue to be uh, engaged in this in this work. We're in it for the long haul. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much, Stacy. And and on that note, I just want to remind you that after. Uh, our last speaker, uh, which is coming next. Uh, just want to get your minds going. Uh, everybody will have a chance to, to share if you would like to, and start thinking of, in terms of uh, what were some of the highlights of the project for you. Uh, for example, something that had a positive effect on the work that you do, or something that you think uh, will impact the community beyond the lifespan of this, of this project. Uh, so just wanted to get your minds going. Um, and I want to thank all the, the the speakers for keeping you know the the time is excellent. We're doing great time. It is always a concern when we don't have that much time. And uh, 
I want to introduce our last speaker for uh, this afternoon. And just to remind you, we'll do a, a little bit of a open mic after the, uh, Father Peter. Thank you so much for patiently waiting there, Father Peter. Uh, I think that, um, you know, what can I say other than the, the fact that you've been a great supporter uh, of the project and, and of migrant workers, even before, you know, the, the empowering uh, um, temporary foreign workers program started. Um, so I want to thank you for that. And um, Father Peter is, is, uh, works at the Blessed Sacrament and St. Anthony Daniel um, Parish in, in Ontario. Uh, Father Peter, I'm going to leave it to you to introduce yourself if there's anything else that you wanted to share with, 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 with the um, partners here. Mike is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, everyone. Yes, uh, so as Alfredo said, I uh, work in this Brent area. Grand County, and uh, with us in this uh, discussion is uh, Fanny uh, Restrepo de Belkowski, who is the uh, is coordinator for the project as well out of Simcoe. So uh, we represent a collection of different groups. I was doing my projects uh, from a few years ago in Brant area. There was the, uh, the Friends of Migrant Workers in Linden. There's the Caribbean Workers Outreach Program. And there were a collection of volunteers in Norfolk. So what this unique project that way was proposed to us was to try to bring us together. So I would say this was two phases in, for us. We, the first phase was the first three months getting together, planning, strategizing, how to coordinate, because we're covering also thousands of square kilometers and we we all had our own little sectors our own little uh, enclaves that we worked in not that we weren't unfamiliar with each other but never working in a more integrated way so thanks to kairos and to the funding the program it gave us an opportunity to sort of channel all those uh resources human and and financial and for the benefit of our migrant workers and norfolk is uh is a big area, Brant to an extent, but Norfolk is a large, a large area of thousands of migrant workers that uh, are working the fields every year. So our, our hands-on work really started to take off in April, of course, because that's when most of the workers, the bulk of the workers started to arrive, April, May, and even into June, and there'll still be workers arriving uh, even as late as uh, July and, and August. Because of the program, we were also able to establish the Migrant Worker Center for Solidarity in Simcoe, which was very important. We needed a, a place, we needed a hub, if you will, where the migrant workers could uh, congregate with, the, with the, the Toronto Neighbors Organization, TNO. We collaborated with that to have a presence. Uh, obviously, as it was mentioned, pre-COVID, things were different. You can have gatherings, more individual sort of contacts. Uh, during COVID, we had to kind of work around it, COVID safety, and to be aware of that. And not only for our safety, of course, but for the safety of the workers. Because I always tell people that, uh, you know, the, 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 they're more vulnerable than we are in a way, because they're the ones living in congregate living. And as you could see with the, with the outbreaks, and we've had unfortunate deaths, uh, th this is the result, right, of their living situation still challenging. So, as I said, this gave us a wider scope uh, to outreach. I think uh, statistically we were able to reach about 6,000, if I'm not mistaken, of which about 700 had indirectly or direct contact with our worker center in Simcoe. Uh, we also uh, provided gift bags of PPE sanitizers, packaged foods, uh, other essentials, toiletries, and we provided over 3,000 gift bags and delivered them as well. Again, always taking safety into consideration. Our goal too was also to foster those kind of important relationships we need in the community to make the people in the wider community aware of the presence of the migrant workers. And also, sorry, <laughs> and also to, uh, uh, develop a relationship ongoing with our farm working community, our farmers. Uh, we, we always insist that with the farmers, we're here to help, we're here to support. 
Uh, we want to be of assistance whenever we can. So that's our, that was our aim and our goal. Most farmers were very receptive. Some, you know, I guess some are, tend to be a little bit more protective of their, their territory. So we always respect that in the end. We also cooperated with the health units like the Norfolk Haldeman region, the Brant region, the Grand River uh, Clinic as well. So we had different kind of cooperation and, and organiz, uh, interaction with those groups. And our committee, if you will, it consisted of, as I said, myself, Fanny Restrepo, Lennox Scarlett, Ella Haley, Richard Tunstall, Eliseo Martel, and Guadalupe de Sillas, uh, who was also our, our uh, wonderful landlady who allowed us to have the space in Sibco as well. So yeah, so essentially in a nutshell, this is the kind of short-term immediate work that we're doing. And yeah, you know, like we said, we hope to continue to continue build on that and to follow up uh, with the important contact to WhatsApp, through the social media. Uh, and so it, it definitely gave us greater access and more a wider scope of, of uh, outreach than, than in previous years. Thank you. Great, and thank you so much, Father Peter. I, I was seeing some of the comments in there and uh, people are obviously thanking you and others uh, and everyone actually in the project for the work and the dedication put uh, you know, to making life um, a lot better and safer for migrant workers, but also for the communities where they live and work. Um, so we're gonna take time now uh, for you, um, anyone, everyone to, um, Offer your comments, your reactions, your questions. Uh, as I was saying earlier, um, what are some of the positive um, effects that the work is, has had on you and the community? And what is what are some of the impacts that you, you think that this project has uh, made that will go even beyond this, this the lifespan of this project? So the, the, the floor is open. Uh, I'm gonna ask my Kairos colleagues who are here with us today, Connie and Cheryl and and uh, and Shannon. Uh, I see some some uh, good uh, friends there. Uh, David, who actually is partly responsible for putting together the, this webinar series, who joined us today. Um, probably uh, Jalen is probably here as well. I can't see everybody, but I'm gonna ask you to please help me uh, in, in case I lose track of the hands. I saw Connie's hands first, but I also saw Tara's hand there. So Connie, would you go or would you want Tara to go? Um, I'll go first. <laughs> okay, all right. Because, uh, oh. Yeah, because um, before we open the, you know, the, the conversation, I just wanted to point out um, that of the five speakers and organizations that, you know, we heard from, actually, uh, they are representing about 16 and, or, or 18 organizations, community organizations. For example, when Nate was talking about the work in Niagara, he is part of you know, the, migrant, the Niagara Migrant Workers Initiative uh, or in a working group, which compose of four other organizations, the Gateway Community Church, the Caribbean Workers Outreach Program, uh, the Niagara Migrant Workers Welcome, and of course, Nate's group, which is the Southridge Community Church. And when, you know, when Sandy talked about the work of Unknown Neighbors, Unknown Neighbors is in partnership also with five other organizations as part of the steering committee. And, um, and Father Peter, he mentioned, you know, the other uh, members of the organizations that's part of the Center uh, for Migrant Workers Solidarity in Simco. Um, the FCNB, the Filipino Community uh, Associate uh, Network in New Brunswick, actually they also have chapters in different uh, cities and municipalities in, in New Brunswick. So when they are working and reaching out to migrant workers in the province, they mobilize these networks uh, in addition to partnering with community health groups, with legal clinics, 
uh, service uh, provider organizations and settlement organizations. So you can just, you know, imagine uh, the, the breadth of, you know, uh, community organizations, individuals and supporters collaborating in in reaching out uh, and providing support to uh, migrant workers in their respective uh, uh, localities or areas. So I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to point that. Great, and thanks, Connie. So Tara, your hand was up, so the mic is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you collaborate with any organizations in Western Canada? I'm from BC and or do you collaborate with Sanctuary, which is for the health rights of migrants? Thanks. Can I respond to that? <laughs> yes, please. I was going to say that sounds like it's a question for Connie and you will. Um, yeah, go ahead, Connie. Yes. So as far as the micro justice program at Kairos is concerned, we collab we have the Kairos local network. So we have a network member in BC and you know we collaborate with them. We we work on you know the migrant justice uh, issues and reaching out migrant workers in different uh, localities across Canada. But specific to this project, our project coverage is quite specific to Ontario and the three maritime provinces. Although there are Service Canada partners in BC as well, so I can refer you to to Mosaic. Uh, AMSA, and there is another one, oh, Success. Success is the organization that's providing support and services uh, at the airport, welcoming uh, migrant workers and accompanying them. So Mosaic is similar to Kairos uh, that, you know, receiving funding from the federal government and then sharing this funding to community organizations in the province. Thanks, Connie. I just wanted to add also, Tara, that, uh, you know, Lucky uh, Kairos has been fortunate enough and blessed enough to be able to work with partners across, across the land. So in most provinces and territories, in fact, here in this call, you know, I can see uh, somebody that lives in Manitoba and is part of the uh, Migrant Workers Solidarity Network in Manitoba uh, and also a member of Kairos um, Manitoba, uh, that's Thomas Novak. And so there are partners all across the land that uh, Kairos collaborates with uh, to be able to, to do this, this uh, support and solidarity work to, with and for migrant workers. So at any time, you know, outside of the webinar, we'll be more than happy to, to continue the conversation with, with any one of you to be able to continue building the network. Um, I, 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 I see a lot of hands up or, or is it just wishful thinking? Uh, TNO, we'll go, we'll go to TNO. Um, so I just wanted to uh, say uh, uh, to all our partners in this project, uh, whether Ontario or nationally, we partnered with and we did uh, so much amazing, amazing, amazing work. And, and I cannot believe looking at our final reports uh, as uh, from TNO's point of view, we touched 26,300 people within that five and a half months and, and, and the staff who are on front line. And I think uh, Joseph will mention, you know, sometime traveling far and wide and to small remote places, uh, field might be physically tired, but it's such a rewarding to connect. And, and I tell you, part of being this vaccination, and there are a lot of hesitance around and how the, giving them the right information and resources in the simple language they were able to understand and, and make decision, it's make a huge, huge difference. And we strongly believe uh, this project touch not only the migrant workers, the partners that we are working together, especially I had a pleasure working with um, uh, Simcoe folks, whether it's with the father, father Peter, whether it's on a personal note or on a partnership level, it's just a huge thing. And, and TNO being part of uh, nationally and Ontario wide, and we had an opportunity to build capacity with our uh, you know, colleagues to give them the resources and sharing the resources to make it easier for. And, and I, I wanted to say, you know, it's really like one more day of this project and, and not you know, it's it's just being uh, how many things that we could do it together. It's amazing. I just wanted to say on behalf of TNO, even yesterday, the one of the highlights I wanted to say is 
we had our annual general meeting at yesterday uh, evening, there were so many migrant workers who were able to join and participate, which I thought it was an opportunity for them to share their thought as a bigger, broader level. And then, you know, uh, having them, uh, you know, uh, say, uh, feel that they have a voice and in, in, in people are listening. I thought that's one of the things I will say. And then we have so many stories, people share and videos and all that. So I just wanted to share uh, to all of you as partnered in this project uh, to federal government for funding this and then Kairos to getting these all the partners together. It's an amazing work done. And I hope and hope uh, uh, we will continue in a different level too. So I just wanted to say thank you and heartfelt congratulations from TNO to all of you for the amazing work. And I'm sure we will uh, continue to do and I know before the funding or not and everyone's heart and soul into this and getting our migrant worker friends safe and sound and 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 some of you are not you know new to this uh, and you were been doing doing this uh, in a different level just thought on a good note this is an amazing thing that we all did it together and need to be congratulated for so thank you Thank you so much uh, to the neighborhood uh, um, organization. And who was speaking on behalf of the neighborhood organization? Yes, Jennifer. Yeah, I put it here, no, because there were two, three people joining together, hey. as you know. So that's why I don't wanted to put my name only. I said TNO. Yeah. Uh, and, and so. Uh, so Jennifer and, uh, uh, and, T and TNO uh, partners, thank you so much for also for your participation and the support. It's been great. It's very impressive, actually. What you've done and continue to do and uh like you uh we look forward to continue you know uh collaborating in one way or another um i also uh, it was brought to my attention here that there was a question from ruth um about uh if if there is medical and then there's dentistry available when migrants are right um does anybody here have an uh, would like to take a stab at answering that Sorry, what was the question? The question is, uh, it's in the chat there, but it says, is medical and dentistry available? Right. And then separate from the question is, tragic death of migrants soon after arriving. We know that there've been a, a few um, deaths for migrant workers, even when they are still in quarantine. And that's probably what Ruth is referring to. But the question, the specific question is if there is medical and dentist, dentistry or dental support or dental health available when migrants arrive. Connie? I can, uh, I can you know, provide some you know, answers, I guess. So migrant workers are covered by the provincial health care that they are uh, going to. So, for example, if they are coming in Ontario, they're covered by OHIP and, and so uh, other provincial health coverage as well. Um, so these are very basic uh, health care, but there are community health uh, clinics that can provide more than what uh, the, the, the provincial health care can, you know, can provide. So I guess it's, it's making those relationships uh, with this existing community health clinics. The other thing that I would like to bring up, and, and this is really related to healthcare. What I found out, for example, coming from the reports of our partners, for example, in PEI, a migrant worker have to wait for 183 days before uh, the, the provincial health coverage kicks in. And in Ontario, we have to wait uh, 90 days, so uh, three months. And meantime, employers are obliged to buy and make sure that workers coming in are provided with private uh, medical or health insurance while waiting for the provincial uh, health care to, uh, to kick in. And, and I think this is something that we can all work together in terms of I don't know, an, an advocacy or a call or representation to both the federal and provincial governments uh, to shorten uh, the waiting period for healthcare to kick in. Because some workers, for example, are only here for very short contracts. 
And before they are able to access healthcare, their contracts are, are finished. So this is, I guess, something that, you know, moving forward, what are the issues that we want to bring up and kind of advocate uh, that, that regardless of provincial, you know, uh, jurisdictions. Thanks so much, Connie. Um, I will see some comments on the chat there. I wonder if if um, Stacy would like to to comment on 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 the answers you provided on the chat. And then I also saw Fanny's uh, hand to be put up. Uh, Fanny, if you still want to speak, we'll come back to you. Okay. Stacy, would you like to to comment on on the answers you provided? Yes, I was just saying. Uh, unfortunately, here in Nova Scotia, uh, migrant would have to be here for uh, one year to be able to access uh, public health care. So the, the, yeah, they unfortunately don't qualify for the provincial health care. And there's definitely some uh, challenges around that. Also, uh, oftentimes they're not provided with information about what is covered. Like I've seen, you know, some people like weary of, of even uh, reaching up to get information about their private insurance because they're worried their employer might find out. Or we had a situation with a worker who ultimately, uh, he had a workplace injury and uh, the employer took away his health, his uh, insurance card. Um, so these are kind of some of the things that we've, we've seen, um, unfortunately. All right, um, thanks, thanks, thanks again, Stacy. We'll go to Fanny and then uh, I think pa uh, Father Peter also put his hand up. So, okay, um, when it comes to uh, dental insurance, they have coverage through Cowan Insurance. So they pay privately uh, for dental insurance. They have to make an appointment uh, with the doctor and bring the, the health card from um, Cowan Insurance. That is in Ontario. Uh, also, they are covered by OHIP up until in Ontario, up until December 15. So they can... Um, I know at the hospital, sometimes they don't have the card, uh, but if they've been in Canada uh, from previous years, they, they kind of um, take that, that number. Uh, but uh, in case of uh, dental, Cowan insurance, insurance will cover the workers. And, and uh, to let everyone know also, um, if a, a worker is, came to Canada, and he came out of uh, quarantine and he got, the, the worker got COVID um, and has to go into quarantine, WSIB um, pays for the worker. Uh, it's very important to know. And there is a special person, her name is uh, Kendra Holiday from WSIB that is in charge of um, those cases. Thanks, Fanny, and uh, we go, we'll go to uh, Father Peter. Yeah, I was just going to say one, one group that we partnered with in the, in the community is the uh, Grand River Health Clinic, which provides different uh, kind of services. One of the things that they were providing pre-COVID was a kind of um, like a health clinic in places like uh, in, a, in a plaza area where the migrant workers will be shopping, congregating, on a Thursday or Friday. Uh, obviously with COVID, there were some uh, limitations and restrictions. And one other piece that was always uh, identified, especially by Eliseo, is the mental health piece. That's another very, very important and uh, undiagnosed area for, for the workers. Uh, imagining the stress that they're under with COVID, with the family, with uh, everything, everything that they have to um, you know, uh, endure. Uh, mental health is definitely another important area that needs to be addressed. And again, it's, it's always, it's not evenly spread out. Uh, it depends on who can gain access, who can get the information, who can, who is uh, able to reach it or, you know, transportation wise, because we're a rural community. So there is a lot of uneven access to service. That's one of the big challenges. Thanks very much, Father Peter. Um, yeah, I saw uh, Aswani from TNO uh, hands up, and then we'll go to Luz Wilson. And I also see that there is a question or 
or a yeah a question from Susan and we'll get to that. So Aswani. Yes, hi. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be part of this uh, amazing group and I, I was doing outreach work with TNO under the Kairos program and just going to like the question about like the insurance and health coverage. Uh, yes, a lot of the workers have like uh, that come with a swap program. Uh, they have co one insurance. Unfortunately, a lot of them, they don't know. They don't know what they are entitled to. So for for me, I think um, it was so great that we have these kind of organizations and we are doing these um, these groups, right, to, to let them know. Sometimes uh, workers will reach out to me and I'm like, I went to the dentist and I'm like, okay, you are covered. So I will help them because there is a quite a process to, to, to do the, the claim, right, for the insurance. So if the employer is, is good and help them or the human resources is great, but if they don't have somebody to help them, it's really hard for them to claim that, um, that insurance, right? So uh, I think that's a, a great thing that we have done as our organizations, help them, like it's part of all the education. And yes, um, so I'm really glad and we have reached out so many workers and it's just nice to, to learn, right? It has been a learning process too. Like I, I, I was not sure about how one and then I was talking to some other organizations and I read and I learned and, yeah, I think um, there is so much to learn because there is so much need to help. Thanks so much, Aswani. And uh, I see uh, Luz Wilson's hand is also up. Thank you. Yes. Um, I am in Sogin Shores, and indeed, the Mexican workers that are in this area, I have learned that the private uh, insurance with Cohen is an incredibly um, good one. It covers them for everything. Um, leave of absence, medical leave. Um, it is just remarkable, but as the previous speaker said, they really don't know very much about the, the coverage of this insurance. And that is a process that probably needs to be addressed. But my question at this particular time is regarding a Dr. Donald Cole. I don't know if anyone has been approached by Dr. Cole. Um, we suffered the death of a Mexican worker here this year. And he approached our volunteer group with um, some uh, comments and a proposal to offer medical care for workers in this area of Ontario. He will travel to any area where he will be given a space to offer medical services for temporary workers. Has anyone heard of this doctor? Uh, that, uh, uh, sorry, maybe I could say uh, there are a lot of family practitioners and doctors and they come out and they offer their services because of the COVID, you cannot have a common camps or a place they can ask services, but a lot of inquiries also coming from the doctors, uh, especially individually. Uh, they are seeking if they need any support, a uh, group of physiotherapists and different practitioners also willing to help because of the COVID and they heard the news. Uh, we also heard uh, from few doctors who were willing to, to support, but at the moment, the the issue is uh, you cannot uh, meet anyone face to face and and setting up something like that and you also need to have that conversation around I think that's one of the things maybe we should all come together and think about how we can get these resources given to to the the migrant workers that themselves I thought the group of physiotherapists who are willing to show them gentle uh, you know exercises or something that can it's help them during the, the period while they're working long hours and lifting so many things. And, and they came together and asked, this is something that you wanted to, 
to show them, you know, and I was thinking they normally don't have access to physiotherapist and massage therapist and all that. Is it maybe exactly. another way of working with the uh, medical professional to, to yes. have that support around? And there well, are a lot of community health also. And, and I think... Uh, I think that would be very, very important as well. But this particular doctor is an emeritus professor from the University of Toronto. And he has a hobby farm in, in this vicinity. Um, but he, he's particularly focusing his uh, studies on occupational injuries. So what he would like to propose to both workers and farmers is the right PPE equipment, the, the techniques to work the fields, all of this that, as you are mentioning, are very important issues for the long-term health of the workers doing repetitive work uh, season by season. So I'm wondering if I could refer this doctor to to the group and who will be a good person to talk to this doctor and, and maybe um, assess the possibility of incorporating his services once we can, we can get together or they can see person to person. Um, who do you think would be the right person to refer Dr. Donald Cole to? I could see some message from OCAV they already know, and I think they have uh, mentioned something on that uh, chat. Yeah, I can see already, Luz, on the, on the chat that uh, uh, at least a couple of partners of this project um, already work and collaborate with Dr. Uh, Donald. So um, I guess we could continue the same process, you know, so it sounds like it's already connected to but in any case, if you have if you have any more information that you want to share or or any suggestions you would like to make, you can always send us an email here at uh, you know to Connie Sorio, for example, who is coordinating the the this overall project. Very uh, good. It sounds, like, it sounds like there's already contact and connections with. I also want to encourage you to to read the the chat in case you haven't read it. Uh, there's quite a, a couple of comments there. One is from Susan, um, <clears throat> which it kind of summarizes uh, what sort of, uh, what will be the hope in terms of, uh, you know, contributing to improving the, the, the life of migrant workers uh, while they are here. Uh, so uh, Susan, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that uh, or do you, are you okay with just putting the comment on this chat? Well, I, I just was trying to get a sense of like if in the ideal world, rather than I'm, I'm guessing we'd rather have major systemic change with with supports coming from communities too. So this is how I phrased it. And are these the points that we need to be working towards? It's a question to to mm -hmm. you and Connie and others who who have this, um, you know, this overview. Thank you. Well, thanks. I, I sure I can give you a short answer, but that's again that's my very own personal short answer, right? And 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 the question, the answer is yes. That's that's our hope. That's what we would like to see. Uh, but I would like to, I see Connie's hand up, and I also see uh, TNO's hand up. I'm gonna go to Connie's first, and then uh, and then we we'll go to TNO. Um, thank you so much, Alfredo, and thank you so much, uh, Susan, and also Luz. Um, I, in when you were talking about who the a good doctor code can connect with, I was actually thinking of Okao as well. Okao is a partner uh, of this project. Okao is the uh, occupational health clinics uh, for Ontario workers. So that is a very, very good connection. But also uh, like talking broadly, uh, this, you know, uh, Dr. Cole's offer can be actually integrated in a more comprehensive uh, way in, in such a way that, you know, we can, we can encourage other medical practitioners uh, to volunteer and be able to provide this service, you know, to, to, to migrant workers uh, 
in, in addition to what community health clinics are already providing. Um, with regards to what Susan has captured in terms of moving forward and what we want to see changes to have change to happen, I would say uh, within the migrant justice program at Kairos, we do a lot of advocacy and uh, community organizing and support, you know, for workers. It's only actually last year when COVID uh, hit that we kind of shifted uh, a little bit of our work towards providing direct uh, service to migrant workers. We haven't done this before, but responding to the crisis and also responding to the, the critical need uh, need of the time needs of the time, we we shifted and include direct service provision to uh, as part of our work and. This is kind of a hit and miss because we're new uh, in this field and also in building relationships with uh, with the government in in implementing you know in the project implementation. So it's it's a it's a learning curve for uh, for us at Kairos. But at the same time, I really do not want to. Uh, well, I would I was about to say diminish, but I really want to highlight the achievements that we were able to. To, to achieve, uh, to get in, in, the, in the six months that we are implementing this project. It's not only about the numbers of migrant workers reached, although it is very, very important, but most importantly, the relationships built with communities who are already there, who are already existing and providing the support to migrant workers and the funding and the support uh, enable them to enhance uh, and 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 increase that level of support and work, you know, with community uh, with migrant workers. So this is this is, I guess, one of the biggest highlights that we we can report back to you and to the general public in terms of the most uh, the biggest achievement uh, we're able to uh, to get from the six months uh, work. Um, so yes, Susan, moving forward, this is this continues to be uh, the spirit of our work at Kairos in terms of making uh, fundamental change, uh, generally speaking, to provide and to provide protection and support to migrant workers who are brought here in Canada. Thank you, Connie, and thanks everybody for your for your contributions, both um, speaking or also through the chat. Uh, I'm going to take one more participation at this point, and then I'm going to have us to move to the last section of, of today's webinar, which is to talk a little bit about how do we maintain the momentum and continue strengthening the, the network and the work that we are doing collectively. So I just want to keep you, you know, get your mind going on that. How do we maintain momentum? Uh, what actions can we take um, to strengthen the work that we are doing collectively? So TNO. I just wanted to share that one thing that uh, through that uh, the, this process, we were able to uh, do some peer leader training with uh, migrant workers themselves, even when this um, you know shortcoming, we might be not there, but building the resources, giving them, sharing the resources, especially, and I think uh, as Vani talked about, you know, even though you have a private insurance, not knowing, but, you know, teaching one person or giving that person information who lives in the farm so they can share, it worked very well and helped. And they were able to connect others, you know, simple things like, you know, showing them or giving them the right information. So teaching their peer leaders to be a leaders in their own group. So that's it's another learning and, and an opportunity for us to work with amazing seven different people in seven different farms. That was just an idea that, you know, maybe you could also see if you see potential. There are so many of them could do and the resources get shared in, internally in their own time. And we might not have the time or we might not be not around, but at least they know to share with the others. So I thought maybe I will share that with everyone. Maybe you can, you know, if you are not able to, then somebody else can uh, within the farm community. I mean, migrant workers could do that too. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, that we move to the next, um, the last portion of this, of this uh, webinar. And that would be, I would like to give uh, the speakers uh, maybe two or three minutes each 
to offer your reflections or your input uh, on uh, how to maintain momentum. How do you see it? How do we maintain momentum and continue to strengthen the, the network that we're building and the work that we're doing collectively? Uh, unfortunately, we lost Nate, uh, but um, I'm gonna start with, with, with Jezebel. Jezebel, would you like to offer some comments on that? Yes, um, I'm just going to move it out here. Sorry. This is when, when you when you when you're working. Why are you working? I was in the car earlier because uh, I'm working and it's yeah, super loud yeah. if I talk there, so I had to move out. But anyway, so my reflection um, on this is that um, really uh, to listen to uh, workers, listen to their. Um, anything. It can be a story of their life. It can be uh, something that uh, they've learned all throughout their, their journey as a, as a migrant worker. And um, in order for us to get their trust as well, uh, we need to let them know that we're not just listening, but we're doing something for them. So that's one way of um, getting their trust. So yeah, I think uh, that's what I can share as of now. Great, thank you so much, Jezebel. Um, it's a good point, it's a very good point. Listen to workers, listen to what they have to say. And then we often reflect on the fact that we would like migrant workers to be pretty much here with us, but we also understand that they're restricted by the work that they have to be doing, right? So, so that's very difficult for them to take the time uh, at this time, for example, to, to be able to participate. But that's great. Uh, we're going to go to Sandy um, uh, of our non neighbors. Sandy, your comments? Um, so, what I have found has been um, really working around our area, and because we are so new, is uh, continuously sharing our information uh, with everyone and anyone we speak to. Um, I have found amazing connections in just talking about the work that we've been uh, doing. And um, I've, I've learned that um, I, I find the connections in, in the most interesting places like schools um, because I have four children. So I spend a lot of time talking to teachers and educators and um, they've now connected me to the ESL teachers and those ESL teachers have connected me to other ESL teachers and um, they are very connected in the community as well. So I feel that to continue the momentum is just to continue sharing um, the project, what we're doing, uh, what we, what, who we're trying to reach. And um, so far organically, I mean, in Simcoe County alone, I think we've reached um, a lot of people and, and the feedback has been very, very positive. Um, and everyone is willing to help in whichever manner that they can. So um, for me, I feel that continuously sharing and communicating with everyone in our community um, is, is really impacting the project. And I found that there is a lot of interest from everybody uh, because everybody wants to help somebody in some way in some manner, be that by volunteering or by um, sharing more information, sharing more posts uh, via Facebook. So I think that that's the main thing for us is to continue to communicate and share all of our ideas and hopefully continue to grow. Perfect, thank you so much, Sandy. That's great. And we're gonna go to um, Stacy. Thank you. Um, I think one thing definitely, as others have mentioned, it's been really great to collaborate with others. So I would love to continue that collaboration. And also uh, I know here in the Atlantic, we had a few meetings um, here. And uh, I think that was really great uh, sharing the context of what's happening, some of the challenges that we were facing and so on. And so, yeah, I would love to continue to do that. And uh, we also had like a capacity building session around open work permits and supporting uh, workers with open work permits for vulnerable workers. And even now, yeah, we're working on on uh, on uh, one plus um, 
open work permits. Uh, and so, yeah, I would love to continue to have these kind of spaces for capacity building, because I think that will, yeah, help us to continue to be uh, strong in the work that we do, learn from each other. Um, so, yeah, that in a nutshell is, uh, yeah, what I'm thinking. Um, and also, yeah, continuing to provide people, uh, I would say, community members with ideas on actions they can take, like simple actions, because I think people always want to be supporting, but they don't necessarily know how. And so even with, as I mentioned, with the seedling, uh, the seedlings that we that we gave to migrant workers, that was one concrete thing that that community members were able to do is support us with uh, growing seedlings. So uh, yeah, I think there's lots of ways that community members can be engaged in, in this work. Great, thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, Father Peter, your reflections. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. So, yeah, so obviously we want to also continue building on those important relationships and uh, communication uh, with our different partners, uh, with obviously internally, but also with the other community organizations that have been very supportive of our efforts and our, our outreach. Uh, one challenge I did forget to mention was... Uh, we're working with uh, is uh, encountering workers in distress, meaning uh, workers that might be in a unfavorable working situation, living condition. And uh, really we find that legally, what are their, what are their options? You know, it's, it is difficult. We're obviously not lawyers or we're not, uh, we're not in enforcement officers. <laughs> but we do try different ways to help them support them as we did uh, this past uh, this past season or this season uh, two brothers that were in distress so yeah finding ways maybe a sort of a plan of action how to implement that and where to begin and how to follow through with that because uh, once a worker decides to leave a farm he is technically he or she is in breach of contract that's the way it's seen and uh, so yeah so finding more obviously legal protective and more uh, secured rights so that they can uh, have a better way of, of facilitating their uh, their needs and if necessary transfer as well so yeah great thanks everybody uh, that's that's those are very good comments um at this point i'd like to open the floor for a few minutes Anybody, any one of you partners who would like to uh, weigh in in terms of how do you see um, keeping the momentum going and strengthening the, the work that we're doing collectively. Um, we still have a few minutes left before we come to the conclusion of this seminar. So the floor will be yours. I see Luz Wilson. We're gonna start with Luz. Thank you. Um, we are really not formally part of your organization, although I think we would love to be part of it. Um, however, um, because I am Mexican and I work for the Mexican Embassy in Ottawa, uh, when this program started many years ago in the 70s, um, I ever since I retired here, I have been closely related to the Mexican workers in the area. And the way I started was to empower them with talks that we held. Luckily, this is a semi-urban rural area where we had access to a library and we were able to have conversations about the rights, about the issues, about their stories, listening to them. So now I see that they are empowered with technology. And because the Mexican telephone company has a program that is cheap to connect between Mexico and Canada, they all bring the cellular phones with them and they all communicate with WhatsApp. And through this uh, medium, we have been able to hold conversations with them during the pandemic time about um, 
the issues because of the death of the individual here, it was more important to keep in touch with them, we felt. So this technology helped us to keep in contact with them. But not only that, I saw that there was the possibility to expand the services in the same way of technology and maybe have English as a second language and other sessions related to the interest that we could apply through WhatsApp or Zoom or any other medium. That would be my recommendation. Great, thanks, uh, Liz. And um, we're gonna go to Maria Cristina, then Elizabeth, and then Aswani. So Maria Cristina? Yes. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's Maria Cristina. Yes, I'm sorry, I have an uh, internet issue, so my um, video is going to be off. And, um, but I, I was really I, um, inspired for everything that we're doing here in this program. And since and we start from zero, like uh, we have connections, and then we can be able after six months to provide a lot of service. We haven't shared with all the people um, that belong to this group so many experience so for me the momentum is just to keep working for the for the um, for the workers in that way that connection and building uh, a structure to support them is one of the main thing that we should keep doing uh, because this never happened before and now we are so strong in different in different ways to support the workers. And um, so the experience that we have here after uh, two break out of COVID is like that with workers without support, there will be so, so empty space for them. So thanks God that we have this experience and we have all the chance to support them in crisis. So thank you so much because this is wonderful. And we have to keep doing this for the worker. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria Cristina. We'll go to Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm the, the outreach uh, coordinator for the uh, Durham Region Solidarity Program. And this last six months is being a hard touching for me. I'm that we don't, we are not going to stop in there because um, still we are doing a lot with them. So. Uh, we will keep supporting them and it's been a great experience listening to their stories as um, and trying to navigate with them for solutions either from their families that are in mexico or for them that are in here in all means and that relation building that we have with the workers we want to keep it and it is something that we have been doing other than this project we have been doing by heart like for me i've been doing it's something i really love to do and and I will continue to support the workers um, in any means if they need. And I know that through the, this network, we can always reach at each other and, and trying to find uh, a solution or a way that we can keep uh, supporting them. So it's been a great experience and a lot of learning. And I'm sure we can keep learning and, and give the support that they need because without us, I think they, as Christina just said, it's, it's very difficult for them. And we hear stories from either, we have been working with workers that they are here for two, three years. They don't come only for six months. They have longer um, contracts and they were not even able to go to the bank to do a simple transaction. So with our help, we empower them and, and we hear their stories like, now I can do it and it's thanks to all your, your support. So it's, it's a hard touching, so many stories that we hear from them and I'm very happy that we can continue and support them in all means. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, now we're gonna go to Aswani and then we're gonna go to Leonora. Yes, hi, uh, I just want to share that I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this program because, uh, and this project, because um, like when I heard the name, Empowering Migrant Workers, I was, wow, that, that's something. I've been working and I started working like 12 years as a volunteer with migrant workers. And yes, we reached some, some workers, some farms. And 
uh, but this time I had a more view because we were reaching farms which have like 200 workers, right? Like uh, 300 workers, 150. Then you think like one-on-one -on -one is, is hard to empower. So I, I love the part that we were able to provide like webinars, information sessions, uh, just as Jennifer said, some of them. So you, you just provide that to, to some in the farm and then they share it with their co-workers. And then you're really empowering, right? Because you're giving them the tools. They say knowledge is power. Knowledge is just the tool to be able to have power, right? So I, I think that was a very important part to give them the knowledge, uh, to have the tools to advocate for themselves too, not just for us, because we cannot do, like I say, we're just a couple of organizations so, or many organizations, but it's still, there is like a farm. And when I want a farm, I'm like, I'm gonna empower 200 workers. So if you give them tools to empower themselves and then you help them to advocate for themselves, that's, that's great. And I think that's amazing about this project, right? Like we have done networks, we have done webinars, we have, I find the gaps. And I think the momentum is now, because like I said before, I never saw it. Unfortunately, COVID brought this um, kind of uh, awareness, right? Like how much um, migrant workers are a vulnerable war group and they need our help. But I, I'm like, I mean, if it's something bad that happened with COVID, I'm glad that happened because now everybody kind of turned their eyes to this vulnerable group. And then there is organizations like us and this project. And I just hope that it doesn't stop because Empower is not just one time, right? It has to continue. The supports have to be there, like from like information, communication, support with foods, um, community um, like connections, right? Like sometimes just to like they say like some part, sometimes they just want you to hear. A lot of workers were just like reaching out to me during quarantine because they were like, oh, I'm so bored. I don't know what to do. They didn't have any problems, but they just wanted that connection with somebody, right? Mm -hmm. So this has been great, great experience. Uh, I think we all have this group in our hearts, and I hope, I really hope that this just keeps going, not just for six months, one year, I think that forever, because they are here, they've been here for many, many years, and they are going to continue because they are big, big support for, for, for the food, right? For the food chain and everything in Canada. So yes, that's everything. And thank you. And I have seen all your work and I'm happy that it's just not in Ontario because I'm in Ontario. It's like amazing that it's national wide. It's like a PBC, like Prince Edward Island. I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for everybody. Thank you for, uh, uh, for everything. Great, and thank you so much, Aswani, for the work that you all are doing as well. It, it is exciting. It is exciting. So thank you for being part of it. Uh, we're going to go to Leonor Cedillo now. Hey, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, well, I am Leonor Cedillo. I work for the Occupational Health Clinic so for Ontario Worker workers, uh, mainly in research projects, but I have been in, in touch and working with this project that uh, we at we, uh, uh, our organizations have been involved with all of you. So uh, it's the first meeting that I attend and I know that it is the last meeting uh, at this point, but I was just going to suggest since all these people and all these groups are doing so, uh, such a great work in in the field would that be possible for a uh, kairos to maintain some a uh, a type of uh, meetings with certain frequency monthly or every three months or something like that just for us to uh, be together and know what others are doing and how we could uh, continue uh, being in in touch and sometimes collaborating with uh, with others projects. That's a great question, Leon uh, Leonor. That's that's great. I, for a moment, I panicked because there's a lot of thundering going on in here, and and I thought, am I going to lose connection again? And I also wasn't seeing Connie, but I'm glad Connie's there because I think Lenore's question is is very very clear and specific. And I wonder if if this would be a good moment then. To because I, what I was going to do is I was going to close this this section in terms of the the commentaries and comments and questions from people and then give Connie uh, five minutes uh, to offer some closing commentary uh, for the webinar and uh, for the, this series and I wonder if this is a good time then based on Leonor's questions can Kairos provide some kind of space for people to maintain 
uh, you know, spaces to meet like these webinars and so on. So Connie, I'm not putting you in the spot. No, I'm good. Thank you so much. Uh, I actually went up to open my door because one of my cats was knocking. She wanted to join me. <laughs> she wanted to join the conversation. Um, thank you so much, Lenore, for bringing that up because I mean, uh, this is what we really want to, to continue moving forward. One, uh, not to lose the momentum and also to maintain uh, the relationships built during the project and, and continue to be able to connect, support each other and, and enhance you know, uh, our work and our capacity to do more outreach. We have the Kairos network across Canada. That's another way of being able to connect. Um, and and you know, we're planning just before the project actually uh, came about or we, we got funded. Uh, at the start of the pandemic last year, we started, uh, is it a every two weeks uh, webinar, Alfredo, that we started in March up to end of June in 2020, just to keep ourselves connected and to also monitor and get updated on how the COVID-19 uh, Im impacts on, on uh, the migrant workers. So we want to continue doing this uh, to keep uh, the group and also to bring in you know new new allies new supporters and welcome my workers as well to be able to join us when time permits now um i okay i hope you're not going to be really really mad at me our partners because just now we signed uh the uh, the extension of this project for one more month. So I know that you know we've we've worked so hard uh, to to get in the reports uh, by June 15 and continue to to be able to spend the fundings by the, the funds by June 30. But just today, the day before the end of the project, we got the extension. You know to 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 be able to work more to be able to work for another month. Uh, so hopefully we can use this one month extension to one, to do, to still count the numbers that we're reaching out and to also uh, plan, plan well ahead in terms of how we want this work to continue, the relationships to continue and, and so forth. There is an uh, opening for the possibility of the work to continue beyond July 31st, when where the extension you know ends, uh, and we hope to to be able to go back to our partners and and develop a more cohesive uh, and and continuation of the work that we started from January uh, to to June. So these are these are things you know that we can look forward to and start developing as well on how we can build off from the current project to the next level and and being able to 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 have a long term presence uh, in our communities but also uh, at the at the national level in terms of what we are providing and what we're contributing to ensure the safety of the workers who are coming here in Canada on you know, temporary uh, status. And, and this is also to see great to, again, and the overall advocacy work that the Migrant Justice Program at Kairos and the Kairos uh, in general is uh, doing in terms of being able to, uh, to, to make sure that, you know, workers who wanted to stay are provided with permanent uh, residence status. Um, but that is not part of the project, you know, the work, uh, the activities of the project that we are implementing now, but just providing you a general overview of the whole Kairos migrant justice work. Um, there are other partners at the federal level who are working at different in different provinces. For example, in Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, there is the Calgary, uh, Calgary Catholic Immigration Services. 
that is also provided or funded to be able to do this work. So any Kairos uh, network member in the general, you know, those provinces can connect with CCIS. Uh, I mentioned earlier that in BC, there is Mosaic and AMSA and Success. And in Quebec, I saw um, uh, Marie-Claude uh, Manda from, uh, Manda from uh, Quebec, uh, who is here with us at this webinar. This, there is Immigrant Quebec uh, that is also implementing a similar project in, in, in Quebec. So there, there are a lot of ways of being able to connect, not just in Ontario and the three provinces, but across you know, other provinces with regards to ensuring uh, that migrant workers are protected and that we are also empowering them as Aswani and uh, Jennifer said, you know, um, providing them the knowledge and the information uh, empowers them to be able to advocate for themselves and assert their rights. So I would say um, of uh, in this webinar alone, we have eight community partners with us today. I'm not going to mention the, the, the names of the staff, but we have TNO, we have the Neighborhood Organization, we have the, the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, uh, the Migrant Workers Solidarity uh, Network in Simcoe, and no neighbors in Barrie and the Simcoe County. Um, the Migrant Workers Solidarity or Support Program in Durham, the Niagara Migrant Workers Working Group, uh, FCNB, the Filipino community in New Brunswick, uh, which is in, based in Fredericton, and no one is illegal in Nova Scotia. These are, you know, eight of our 14 community partners who are with us this afternoon. So again, thank you uh, to all our partners and to the Kairos staff team uh, working with us collaboratively in this project and to the Kairos local network members who are with us as well and supporters and allies. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you so much, Connie. That's a great summary. That's what I was hoping for. And I also want to thank you for taking the lead, coordinating the project. Um, I also want to thank you for doing the work that I was going to do and thanking our uh, Kairos partners, but also the Kairos team. Uh, some of them are with us. Cheryl McNamara is with us and uh, Shannon is with us today as well, as it's always been. I also want to take the opportunity to thank uh, David um, Ivany. Uh, David Watts did a, an internship with us uh, early in the project, and he's the one that is uh, Greatly responsible for setting the foundation for the for the webinars. Uh, so thank you, David. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we want to thank um, Service Canada and the federal government for the financial support. And you heard it. You heard it. It's making an impact. It's making a difference, and is um, still needed. And so we look forward to continuing the, the partnerships and continue building and strengthening the network. Um, nothing but good feelings as we come to the term or to the closing of this uh, webinar series. Um, of course, I want to acknowledge also that, you know, the, the speakers for today, uh, thank you so much for each and every one of you. Unfortunately, Nate from the, uh, the South Ridge Community Church in Niagara had to leave. Um, and then also, um, we also had a speaker that was uh, uh, scheduled to speak today. Um, from PEI, from the Cooper Institute, um, and Whitley, but she couldn't join us because she had to go to the hospital to be with her daughter in the delivery of a grandchild. So she sent a message and she, she sent uh, regrets. I told her, don't worry, the most important thing today is the, the, the health of your daughter and, the, and your new grandchild. So we are thinking of them and thanking, sending them uh, our good vibes and good thoughts. Um, we have, yeah, unfortunately, the, the storm is, is doing its job. And, uh, you know, I guess I take this as a sign from the creator as well. Uh, we're coming close to three, but I, again, I, I just came back and I heard you said, Gabriel, would you like to say something? Before I say, before I say thanks, everybody, again, one more time, uh, 
Gabriel, is there any, anything you would like to say before we close? Hey everyone, Gabriel here. Thank you for thank you for giving me some time. I joined the meeting really late. Um, um, I didn't follow everything. However, um, from the little that I I heard, I can say that through Kairos, I'm really happy to be associated with such a project. Um, we all know that migrant workers are vulnerable and precarious, and especially during a pandemic, it, it really it's really a critical and a tough um, situation to be in. When a migrant worker tells you for the 10 years they've been in Canada, that's the first time they feel empowered. When migrant workers, um, who become the work that we do, they expected their liaison officer to do it. And for 20 years, they've like we filled the gap that have been empty waiting to be filled by their liaison for over almost 20 years. How does that make you feel? When migrant workers tell you, when migrant workers tell you that the situation back home is so difficult and um, and the, the situation back home is so difficult. The families are not working and the families during the pandemic are expecting them to, to, to provide help. And it is through Kairos and um, funding Tiano that helps them to, to bridge that gap. What, what, what does that tell you? When, when you have a project that is ending in, in June, now July, and you still have migrant workers coming in and we've not touched them. We cannot leave this, this, this workers, um, um, you know, untouched, not service. We cannot leave um, the, we, it, I don't think it would be a fair thing to leave the, um, to leave the, to, to end a project in the middle of an agricultural season during a pandemic. So it, I think it is very, um, from what I've heard, it is justified that for this project to continue. And um, again, even my telephone or my work number, the workers have those numbers. When I submit, when I return that phone, what happens there? We cannot leave the, the workers hanging. And I would like to encourage everyone to continue the great work. I would encourage TNO and Kairos to, to pressure the politicians. They are the ones who have the resources to, to, to push for the continuation of such a project. And we all know that, we all know that Food is important. We all know that food is even more important during a pandemic. And the fact that unemployment is so high and during, during that time when employment is so high, Canadians still do not want to do that job. It is, makes it even more important for that project to continue. So in, in a nutshell, I would like to thank everyone for making that project possible. I would like to thank everyone for for um, this uh, this um, few minutes to, to to you know to touch base, and I would like to thank everyone to to continue to, to apply pressure to to um, continue such great work. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Gabriel. I'm glad to see you. Thank you, my friend, uh, brother, and uh, thanks everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure to be working with you all this time. Um, before I lose the connection again, I want to say thank you and goodbye. Have a good afternoon. We'll keep in touch.